God is good. You know when we started praying, y'all were singing a song. I think you were singing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you sing that? Is it is there, is there a chance we can just sing that one more time? And as we're singing that song, one of the things that I would like for you to do is I want you to start to prepare to sing your own song of victory. You know, because Hallelujah, praise the Lord. The Bible says that Paul and Silas, they prayed and they sang and the Holy Spirit came down. If we would learn to do all of the things that the Bible says, we will have all of the things that the Bible says. So it's not just praying, it's not just calling for help, it's not just going for counseling and studying the word and quoting scriptures. You need to learn how to raise your hand in worship. We need to learn how to lift our voices in praise. We need to learn how to sing a song in the night. As we call on the name of Jesus tonight in that song, I want you to get ready. Yeshua. Father, we worship the holy name. We call on the name Jesus. Yeshua, we call on you. Yeshua. Lord Jesus, we call on your name, Yeshua. Yeshua. Ah. Let us call on his name, Yeshua. we thank you for the name that is above every other name for the name Jesus alone can say we call on your name Jesus Father we thank you because your word says that in that day anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved we are calling your name in advance oh God we are calling your name in anticipation of victory. We call the name that is above every other name because in that name we have peace. There is no other name under the heavens that has been given to man by which we might be saved but the name of Jesus. Let us not just call your name because others are calling your name. Let us call your name because we truly believe that you are the Savior and that only you can save. Father, we worship your holy name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us all be seated. Praise God. Thank you, guys. God is good. Lord, we call your name. Lord, we call your name. Oh. Lord, we call your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. So tonight, I want to have. A, I want to ask a question. How many people here tonight are ready to hear what God has for them? Praise the Lord. Oh, come on. I see Kayla is two times ready. Josephine is two times ready. Come on, praise the Lord. God is good. Anita is three times ready. 
maybe even five, who knows? <laughs> God is good. Alrighty. Now let me share with you a little secret about readiness. You know, God knows us. He knows what he made when he made us. And one of the things that God has learned, if we can even use that expression, or one of the things that God does in his dealings with us is he doesn't just listen to what we say. You see what I mean? You know, because you can say, oh Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. Send me. I'm ready. You can say that from now till kingdom come. But God is also looking at your heart. He's looking at the posture of your heart. The Bible says God recognizes that several people come to him or that many come to him to offer a lip service. But God is waiting for those people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's go to the book of Obadiah very quickly. Actually, before Obadiah, let's read. Okay, Obadiah. Let's go to the book of Obadiah. Let's quickly touch on the book of Obadiah. Mekan Nahum, Habakkuk. Somewhere in there you have the book of Obadiah. If you find it before Josephine, just uh, wave your hands. <laughs> All righty, God is good. So one of the things that I would like for us to do, in fact, I know that we're going to read a couple of verses from the book of Obadiah, but before then, I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read verse 3 very quickly. The book of Romans chapter 6, we're going to read that very quickly. Thank you, Alan. God is good. Hallelujah. So Romans chapter 6, we're just going to touch on that very, very quickly. Um, so I have Obadiah open here, chapter 1, verse 4, and look at what it says. It says, though you ascend, we're going to quickly go from that to Romans 6, 3. That's why I wanted us to be positioned. It says, anyone excited about this? God is good. Um, let's do something here very interestingly. I think we need to read from 4 to perhaps 12, but I may jump or skip one or two so that we're not here the rest of the evening just reading Obadiah. But look at what it says, the book of Obadiah chapter 1 verse 4. Um, it's only one chapter to be honest, so you can't miss it. It says, though you ascend as a high, I mean as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. I want to expose to us uh, a thing that is going in the world very quickly. You see, when 2020 came, one of the things that the Lord revealed to me was that the kings of the earth, um, in their own minds, they have graduated from just making caves in the holes of the ground, as the Bible says, to hide themselves, themselves from the day of God's great judgment. You know, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the kings of the earth, they will make holes for themselves in the hole of the ground to hide or attempt to hide from God's wrath when it comes. But one of the things the Lord revealed to me in 2020 was that some of them are actually looking to hide in the heavens above. This was not public information and you know how it is. They don't want people knowing exactly what they're really doing and what all of their schemes are about. But you know the Lord will reveal to his people. And the Lord revealed to me very clearly that one of them in particular who is very prominent, who is very well known, started to increase astronomically in wealth. And people could not understand why he was growing so much in wealth. And the Lord showed me what he was doing, how he had promised the rest of his cohorts that if anything happens and things go burst in this realm, he has pods for them that are affixed to the firmament of the heavens. And some people thought I was just being a conspiracy theorist. 
But the Bible says, by their fruits, we shall know them. How many people have seen the movie Elysium? I think that's what it's called, Elysium with Matt Damon. Remember what the kings of the earth did in that movie. They built for themselves a city and they built it along the firmament of the heavens and that is why you have the curvature of the city. When you listen to their narrative, they tell you that the curvature is because of the fact that they had to create an artificial gravity. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know what it is. And when the Lord spoke to me about what was going on and the deal, and people did not really receive my testimony, I was almost going to be bothered. And the Lord said to me, don't worry. Sooner or later, they will know that which I have shown to you. I mean, look at the prophets. Well done. I, I think I like the sound. Thank you. Um, can we just have a little bit of, of volume? Just maybe in my monitor, say just a tad so I can hear myself more. Excellent. Thank you. So, you look at the prophets of old, a lot of them and the things they prophesied about did not even happen until hundreds of years after they had come and gone. And so many people in their times did not regard them as prophets. They were regarded as nuisance. Many of them were regarded as a nuisance. You ask someone like Jeremiah, nobody regarded Jeremiah as a prophet. Nobody liked what he was saying. He was talking, uh, he was prophesying the mind of God to the nation of Israel at a time wherein the people that were ruling were the religious sect themselves. And so whenever he prophesied, they were like, no, that's not what God says. And the people decided to go with those who have titles, who had religious recognitions, rather than going with the man who has the attention of God. And so fast forward to where we are now. What do we see? The Bible already put it forth. Jesus himself speaking, he says, by their fruits we shall know them. And what fruits have they borne since 2020? Since 2020, we have seen such a boldness, an effrontery, and a recklessness in the kings of the earth. They've been doing things as though they do not care if everything crumbles. They do not care simply because in their own minds, they have put measures in place to escape whatever would be the consequences of their actions or inaction. I bring you this word of the Lord today simply because there has been another accelerator that has been applied to the scheme of the enemy. And when I say the scheme of the enemy, we do not give glory to darkness nor Satan. Whatever it is they're doing is exactly what our Heavenly Father will have them do. Okay, let's get that very clear. They think in their own minds that they have a nice little plan to overthrow God. But that's because the Bible says that the deceiver himself will be deceived. So there is no way I am going to soil you with paint without being covered in paint myself. So what is going on in the world today is that we are in a time of great deception and the deceiver himself is wallowing in his work. So they have a nice little plan, but what did the Bible let us know? If you look at the book of Acts chapter 4, Peter was prophesying and he says, why do the kings of the earth plot a vain thing? He says they have all come together to do this thing that the hand of the Lord had foreordained against the Lord and his anointed. So all of what they're doing is what God would have them do. Why? Because God needs somebody to do the dirty job and Satan and his goons signed up for it. And that is the way it has always been. It has always been like that. From the Garden of Eden, through the account of Job, we have always seen that God from time to time will need people to do certain things on the earth. So when you think about it in reality, I'm going to mention the example of Job very quickly because some of you may not have heard my perspective on it. You see, Job was a man that God was very pleased with. And when God is pleased with you, he promotes you. He blesses you. 
But God sees us how? He sees us as wells of living water. Jesus says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living waters. So how do you increase the capacity of a well? If you have a 10-foot well, a 10-foot well, a well that is only 10 feet deep, how do you increase the capacity? You don't build a wall around the edge of the well. What you do is you go down to the bottom and take out more dirt. The dirt is part of the well. So what do you do? You take out the dirt and then you increase the depth. And what happens is now you have more of a well. The water will be cooler, it's gonna be fresher, it's gonna be cleaner. Because the deeper you go, the less of the debris you would have. And so God wanted to increase this well that he was pleased with. But he needed to dig out the dirt. So he put out an invitation that was like a job site. You know, the Bible says there was a meeting of the sons of God. And Satan was there and God was like, hey you, what have you been up to? And he was like, not much. I've just been going to and fro upon the earth. You know, Satan still likes to see himself as the light bearer. So when you ask him what he's doing, he described himself as though he was the sun. You know, the sun goes to and fro upon the earth. And so God asked him, what have you been doing? He says, I've been going to and fro upon the earth. He says, I've not done anything. I've just been observing what's going on. And God was like, indeed. God already knew that it was causing trouble here and there. But he wouldn't admit to it. But you see, God knows his heart. God wasn't just listening to his speech. But you know, the Bible says we are ensnared by the words of our mouth. And God was like, okay, if you claim to be, to be bored, to be doing nothing other than just observing, I have an assignment for you. God said to him, have you considered my servant Job, how there is none like him upon the earth? God was working Satan and Satan did not know. Because God knows that Satan does not like people. He doesn't like man. He is man's adversary. So the moment you tell Satan that there is a man that is doing so well that God is pleased with him, God knew that he was going to be angry and he would want to do something about it. He was, he was like, he was so natural to Satan to want to do something about Job because God said there is none like him upon the earth. How he is so fearful of God. He has the fear of God in his heart and he honors God. And Satan was like, I don't even think much about this guy, to be honest, because you can't be the richest man and not be in God's good, good books. That was what Satan said. Satan said, does he love you for nothing? Have you not blessed him more than all the others? Remember that Job at the time was the richest man in the East. The entire Eastern Hemisphere, there was nobody as wealthy as Job. And so Satan was like, it's the money, it's the wealth. I mean, take all of what he has and he will curse you to your face. And that was, why, that was the moment it became very clear to heaven that they have a man for the job. Satan was the one who recommended what he was going to do. He was such a fantastic consultant at that job. He said, take all of what he has. And God was thinking in himself, that is exactly what I want. I want to take all of what he has right now so that I can increase his capacity to give him more. Because if you know God, you will know that the moment someone is pleasing to God, God will not deprive them. He will promote them. God just said, he is more pleasing to me than anybody else. And you are now saying, take God. So when God says, okay, you can go ahead, Satan should have thought to himself, wait a minute. This something isn't right here. He said that this man is not really pleasing to God or I'm not hearing what God is saying. Because why would somebody be pleasing to God and his reward would be deprivation? Hmm. The Bible says that when a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace, at peace with him. At peace, sorry, with him. And so here is the deal. God wants us to be so confident in him that no matter what life throws at us, we don't doubt the love of God. Paul says, if God loves us so much that he gave us Jesus, he says, will he not together with him, Romans chapter 8, freely give us all things? 
And so whenever you think that you have been deprived, you need to recognize that it only means that God is taking what you have to make room for what you need. You understand what I mean? And so Satan went ahead and what did he do? He signed up for the job and he dug out the well that was called Job by taking what was in the well by taking it out. Of course, the process requires muddying the water that is already there. But God already knows that there is a cleaner, purer, deeper water that will come afterwards. So to God, it was not a disturbance. It was not a loss. It was only part of the process. If we are going to enjoy the fullness of what God is doing in our lives, we need to recognize that God is not out to get you, that God is not out to shame you, that God is not out to, to, to expose you. He is only out to expand you and to promote you. It's either we believe or we don't. The Bible says whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he, God, is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the only time that I should be afraid of what life may bring will be those times that I am not diligently seeking him. And at that particular point in time, my concern should not be about whether I am broke or not. My concern should not be whether I am ill or not. My concern at that particular point in time should be, how do I close this gap between me and my Heavenly Father? Because if I am pursuing after God diligently, then I don't have anything to worry about. The only thing that will come out of that process is what is blessing. So Satan went and tempted Job we saw the rest of what happened. He was taking things away, thinking that he was, you know, reducing the life of Job. Unknown, unbeknownst to him, he was increasing the capacity of Job. Now, I say that because of the fact that if we don't understand what happened between Satan and Job, we will not really grasp what is going on in the world today. You see, Satan is at it again, doing things that God already had in mind to be done for your benefit and mine. But those things don't look like it. Because when we think about God, we think about God as love, as light, and as life. You don't think about God as death. But there are times when the angel of death has to come forth first so that we can see the newness of life that God wants to reveal. Let me take that again. You see, God has agencies. You know one of the things that was revealed in the book of Revelations was when John saw the throne of God. He saw the 24 elders. He saw the four living creatures. He saw angels that were innumerable. And he said all of them were saying the same thing. And what were they saying? They were saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Who is, who was, and is to come. They were all saying in unison, they said, you are worthy to receive all the glory honor and power for you have created all things for your pleasure they are and were created all things so principalities and powers satan and the other fallen angels they were originally made for the pleasure of god and the bible says whatsoever the lord makes stands forever if god makes you for his pleasure you cannot escape doing his will You see, we need to understand these things because of the fact that it is the wisdom that immunes our hearts to fear in these last days. Because certain things in the world are about to look even further away from what you and I would consider the will of God. But we have to know that it is still God at work through these agencies. And so when the word of God assures us that everything works for his pleasure, look at when Jesus crucified, I mean when Jesus was crucified, what did the Bible say later on through the apostles? The Bible says if the prince of this world, which is Satan, had known, he would not have slain the Lord of glory. If you knew that what he was doing was going to backfire like that, that that would be the process of empowering many more Jesuses around the world, he would not have done it. 
But he was sold on the idea that what he was doing would work. He felt like his plan was impregnable. The moment Jesus showed up and he saw that he could be hungry, he was like, wow. The almighty word of God, the power that upholds all things is now walking around this wilderness hungry. He was like, I know what to do. I can fix this problem. I've been dealing with men for thousands of years. Now that he's become a man, it's over. You see, what Satan considered to be to his advantage was actually to your advantage and mine. Everything that looks like it's to your disadvantage is only seeming so because you do not know the strategy of heaven. The moment you know the strategy of heaven, you will begin to laugh at the storm. So the world that we're living in today is full of tears of children of Satan, of agencies of darkness who are still thinking like they thought when they crucified Jesus, that they can stop the next resurrection, that they can stop the body of Christ from attaining the fullness of their testimony. They believe that they can take the earth from us and banish us into oblivion. They still believe very strongly that they can cut down world population so that a minority can own everything and control everything and introduce their own religion. They have introduced it, but enforce their own religion, enforce their own purchasing power, enforce all of their own ideologies because they have to believe it to perpetrate the things that they're doing. We live in a world wherein everything has to be by belief. You see, nothing happens in this world if nobody believes. Because the Bible says that the things that are seen are expressly a function of the things that are not seen. Witches believe in their spells because if they don't, it's not going to work. Let me say that again. Everything in this world can only be made possible by someone believing in the possibility of that thing. We're not just the ones with the monopoly of the ability to believe. It's not just, belief is not reserved for comprehending the existence of an invisible God. Belief is not just reserved for being able to download your spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places. Belief is essentially a universal function that exists between the material world and the invisible world. Everybody has access to belief. Ask the people who think that the sun is a million miles away and is a million times the size of the earth if they have ever seen anything to justify all of that nonsense. No, they just believe it. Ask the people who say that, oh, we evolved from apes and maybe from some kind of reptile. Ask them if they have ever seen an ape in a zoo suddenly bring out a phone from his pocket and texting and making a phone call because he just evolved. They will tell you they have never seen one. When we were students of that atheistic science, I remember I was about the age of 14 and we were made to study the entire work of LSB Lakey and Charles Robert Darwin. And I'm like, this thing doesn't make any sense. I went to the instructor and I'm like, wait a minute, how come it's not happening anymore today? And they came up with another story. They were like, oh, if there was a period that was called the period of Oligocene that happened over 12 to 14 million years. And I'm like, okay, now you're making it difficult for me to prove whatever you're saying. If you say it takes 12 to 14 million years, what you have just said to me is that I just have to believe it. <laughs> I just have to believe it. You understand what I mean? When a lot of people came up with data to prove that the moon is not what they say it is, what did they say? They immediately said that all of the data that has got to do with the moon landing was suddenly lost and there was no way they could recover it and neither was there any backup. And I'm like millions and hundreds of millions of dollars later, not even a floppy disk. Okay, what about the handwritten notes of the scientists? They said oh, all the handwritten notes were confiscated because they're classified and somehow magically disappeared. So basically what you're telling me is that I just have to believe it. 
And so at the end of the day, we need to understand that Satan and his cohorts, they also need to believe that all of what they're doing is possible. You've seen the movie series, The Avengers. You've seen the majority of the plot was convincing all of the superheroes that it was possible for them to defeat Thanos. They spent all that time trying to convince them that it was possible and they got to the point where they actually believed that they could. And I'm like, yeah, that is the story of the fallen angels. That is the story of principalities and powers who are in opposition to God because they believe that somehow they will take the earth from the sons of men because when they were kicked out of heaven, they lost their place. Their places are no more. They are wandering spirits and beings looking for a place that they can call their own and they believe that we are so undeserving of the privileges that we have. That is the reason why they hate our gods and that is the reason why we cannot play with them. It's all about this landed possession. It's all about the earth. Like I told you on Tuesday, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Nowhere else. But they keep pumping us with the illusion of some kind of galaxy far, far away wherein there's another earth and they're getting the best of us to prepare to go to that place. And I'm like, no, 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 no. The heavens and the earth, period. The Bible says God has given the earth to the sons of men as their inheritance. And God says, I will possess it back from the ones who took it, who stole it and give it to you. We have not been promised anything else. Let's not lose it. But here we are, they believe very strongly that they can get rid of us. But they will not. Simply because the word of the Lord is true. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So here is what the Lord is saying to us today. He is saying for you and I to know that even if those people believe that they have some place that they can escape to, that God will find them and bring them to justice. Let's read that Obadiah one more time. In fact, we're gonna read it, we're gonna go to verse 12 and then we'll come back to verse five. He says, though you ascend as high as the eagle and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Look at verse 12, he says, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. You see, the reason why we are where we are today is because even we are going through some form of judgment. Let me say that again very slowly. We are going through some kind of judgment. And someone says, but I thought Jesus already justified us. Oh yes, Jesus already justified us. The judgment that we're going through is not a judgment that leads to condemnation, but it is a judgment that enforces our justification. Because there are still forces who do not want to accept that we have already been justified. And so we have to go through the process. Let me give you an example of how this thing works, right? Look at us in the world that we are today. We have already been given the full access to eternal life. Jesus said in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have life eternal. That is already settled. We already have it. However, if God has already done that and given it to you as a free gift, what if you don't want it? Is he going to force you to come into his rest? No. So he sets everything up so that you can realize how it is to your advantage to choose to walk the path that he set for you. And that is the reason why there is so much darkness in the world today so that you and I will have an opportunity to choose to be the light that he made us to be. If the world is not going through the the decadence that it is going through today, what will be the value of your salvation and what will be your participation in redemption? But if we're looking at what is going on in the world today and the governments of the day are making it such that we come to, they're making it very easy for people to practice immorality. 
for you to just choose to live life as you feel. If that does not happen, then everybody that you see seemingly living moral lives can be bundled into one bracket, whereas that is not fair. Because if I don't steal because the government punishes stealing, then is my lack of stealing righteousness that comes by the fear of God or is it well behavior that comes by the fear of the system? Okay, let, me, let me say that again. You see, many of us don't recognize that true righteousness is when you are operating in the fear of God. What if it is said to you today that you can do whatever you want? Will you want the Lord? If it is said in the world today that every one of us, we can do whatever we please, the Ten Commandments is done away with, the laws of the land, they're done away with, you can do whatever you want. You can wake up tomorrow and say that you're not Antoine anymore, that you become Antoinette. You understand what? We rebuke that in Jesus' name. But... If you can get up and do whatever you want, that is the only condition that would allow for us to know the ones who would truly choose life and the ones who have chosen death. <laughs> you see, Kayla, if you decide to honor the Lord with your body because the word of God says so, we won't know because the law of the land says there are certain things you can do to your body. Now, what if the law of the land says you can do whatever you want with your body? That's when we will know that your choosing to present your body unto God a living sacrifice is because the word of God says so, not because you're going to be punished by men if you don't. You see, God, the wisdom of God is at work like we have never seen it. All of what is going on in the world, when they ask Jesus when he would come back, he says when the cup of wickedness is full. And it's like, uh, what has that got to do with you coming back? Simply because Jesus wants to return for the people that have chosen him as opposed to the people that are compelled to behave right. We're not saved by the laws of the land. Neither are we saved by the compulsion of the restrictions of men. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works, not of ourselves. But if we are not allowed to be truly tested, then what will then be the basis for our justification? It would then be as though God is now being an unjust God by compelling people to be in the light who have actually desired to be in the dark. If there is no darkness, if everything is just light, then you will find people who will be in the light with their eyes closed because they do not want that light. And so God is like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I will make light available to the ones who want it, but then the entire earth is going to be in darkness so that there is a natural selection by divine selection. Let me explain what I mean by natural selection, by divine selection. This natural selection that is going on in the world today, it was by divine selection. God already elected to allow for us to be able to make a choice. That is divine. But it's going to happen naturally because the world is in darkness and some people will just choose to sit in that darkness because it is what feels natural to them. But for those of us who recognize that things are not meant to be like this, what are we going to do? We will rise and then our lights will shine. So don't be, dis don't be demoralized. Don't be discouraged. God is still in charge. This is yet another display of his immaculate wisdom. When, Dave, when Job was being troubled by Satan and his wife came to him and others came to him and they were like, man, you must have sinned against God. He was like, why would you say that? He said, was it my righteousness that brought all of these things in the first place? He says, no. He says, God gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because we tend to think that it was the righteousness of our laws and constitution that has made us the nation that we are. That is what we have always thought. Many of us in the West, we talk down on other nations because we're like, oh, those other nations are practicing evil and all of this and all of that. And God is now allowing for us to actually now be in a civilization that is morally 
deprived so that we can see that there is no righteousness outside of obedience to Christ and there is no righteousness outside of choosing the Lord. You have to make a choice. So you see how it works? We have already been justified, but the justification has to be demonstrated. It has to be prov proven, and that is what it means for us to allow our lights to shine so that then they can see our good works. People can see that I have good works because of Jesus Christ, but if that good works is not put to test, then how am I different from other people? Let us read that verse 12 again. It says, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother. In the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. What is going on in the world today is that we are being tested so that we can come out as gold but the world will make it seem as if we are in distress. You see, but the Lord is saying, I'm the one that work here. When your brother's day comes, you should not be rejoicing. So what does that mean? The Lord is giving us indicators to let us know the ones who are not of us. The people who are ridiculing, when you look online today, when you watch the news today, what are the things that do you see? You see marriage and the idea of being married being ridiculed. Because the church is being tested, people have come to the conclusion that marriage is not worth it. There was a young man, a celebrity, an idol in the world who got divorced recently, about a year or so ago. And he came to Atlanta and he was on the radio. I heard it on the radio and they were like, man, our boy is here for the first time, a free man. Oh, come on. And they were celebrating. They called that freedom. And when young teen when teenagers hear that, what they would associate marriage to is bondage. Because we have been tested. We have been tested in the world to see whether we marry because God says so or we marry because it feels right. So in the midst of all of what is going on in the world and the laws that have been made to make it easier to be separate than to be one, in the midst of all of that, if we still choose to get married because the law says it is not good for a man to be alone, what are we doing? We are taking a stand that we're not doing it because that is the way of the world. We're doing it because that is the way of the word but they be ridiculing us because they believe in their hearts unto their own damnation. But we believe in the Lord Jesus unto our own justification. We are fighting a battle of belief. What do you believe? Who do you believe? Do you truly believe that in the midst of all of these things, God is still the one orchestrating all things to give you an occasion and an opportunity to make it very clear that you have made a choice, not by convenience, but in the fear of God to say, you know what? I'm not going to be one of those people. It doesn't matter what they're teaching children at school. I'm going to teach mine at home because the word of God says to teach them. The Bible says train up a child in the way that he should go. You understand what I mean? Because if we are not tested the way we are tested today. Guess what's going to happen? We would not do what we're supposed to do because the state takes care of all of it. I don't have to teach my children scriptures because they do Bible knowledge at school. I don't have to teach them to pray because once they get to school, the first thing they do is pray. But when the Lord allows for the enemy to start removing all of those things and bringing perversion instead, what has he done to the body? It's now waking us up. Now we're waking up from our sleep and saying, you know what? I do these things because the Lord says to do it. I'm going to connect those two things without reading all of the passages in between uh, with this analogy. The first thing that we read is that some people have already, ex they've already removed themselves from the system. They think that they are above the system. They think they can manipulate the system to the disadvantage of the rest of humanity. God says, I'm going to bring them down. But then at the same time, all of what they're doing, I'm using it to test you. And one way by which you're going to know that they are not of you is because they will begin to celebrate all of the tests that I have put in place as the order. 
they will begin to celebrate the breakdown of immorality as the order. That breakdown is to test you. See, the way it is in the world today is are we being, we are, I mean, I meant to say, being tested to see whether we even know the meaning of unconditional love. And that's not what you think. You see, because sometimes we're like, hmm, unconditional love means I just need to love people regardless. That is what it literally means, love people regardless, but that doesn't mean to love them. To love people regardless doesn't mean to not offend them. You understand what I mean? If I know that Antoine right here has a magic coin that he uses to buy free gas. You remember those times when people used to have those magic coins that they put in and they put it several times and it becomes a lot of money and they can use that to buy things. And I keep quiet because I'm like, man, I love him. I don't want to offend him. The Bible says open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. So what do I do? If I truly love him, I will come after him with the truth to let him know that brother, you cannot afford to keep doing that because, not because of the fact that, oh, the money you're taking from the corporations is going to hurt them. No, you're not doing that because of them. You have to do it because of the Lord. I will come to you and say, you can't keep doing that because if your heart gets used to that way, it will no longer know the way. Does it make sense? But love is what makes me come after him to say that no, because of the fact that I love you, I want to see you live in the path of righteousness, even if it means that I'm going to have to do stuff that will rub you the wrong way, but love stipulates that I stand on the truth, for the truth, so that you can see the truth. But the word is telling us today that we just need to accept everything and everyone because we don't want to upset anybody. So going back to what I said, that what is going on in the world today is a test of the love of God that is on your inside. If you truly love others as Christ loves you, then you would not just listen to all of what's going on in the news and say, well, thank God I'm not one of those people. You see, the people that are removing themselves from the situation are the opposition. They are the ones who want to have the freedom of conscience to say that, well, we're not part of this. We gave them the choice. They chose this. That's on them. You are supposed to immerse yourself into the situation like the Lord Jesus did and intercede and pray for the lost. Let me tell you something. In the early hours of this morning, it came to me very expressly. I know the Lord's been nudging me for a couple of days, but he came very expressly that the times that we are in is a t uh, we are in a time right now wherein we need to pray concerning everything that we do not agree with, everything that we know that is wrong, everything that we know is of the darkness. We need to pray about every one of those things simply because there is no other tool that is effective in the times that we are in. There, there are no other effective tools. There are no alternatives. And let me prove that to you. Let me prove that to you by just saying a couple of things that people have tried in recent times. People have tried in recent times to use the constitution to bring back righteousness, but the opposite effect is what we have seen. More states and more government agencies are adopting full-on satanism over any moral conduct. That is putting it very nicely, right? People have tried to go out to protest and protests have been hijacked. Why? Because Satan knows that some of those tools are the things that we have become accustomed to. So he has sent his people ahead of anybody in those areas. So if you try to use any worldly tool, the people that will receive you, that will encourage you, that will even offer you money are agents of Satan that have already been sent out because God wants you to be reminded that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Even on a more domestic level, do you know how many of us have tried not talking to some people hoping that that will make them come to their senses but that has done nothing but even driven them further away from us. 
Those things don't work. But let us switch to praying for people because as it is right now, the battle is a spiritual battle. That is why I like to call it a battle of beliefs. Because we need to believe in the power of prayer for us to have any meaningful result. We're not going to read everything, but we're going to read verse 7 and then move on to Romans. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says, all the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. I want us to think about that for a moment. The Bible says that what all of the men that are in your confederacy, we are Americans here, we know the meaning of confederacy. The Bible says they shall force you to the border. Now, this scripture is nothing but undiluted prophecy. Because we, especially in this nation, are about to be forced to the border. The way God has designed things from time immemorial is that corruption can take over most of any land, but the borders are reserved for the remnants. Because there is no way God will allow for a temptation to come without also making a way of escape. And I know that many of you in this room have heard people prophesying in the last couple of months, particularly about in the last six months, about certain border nations within this land that people should flee to to avoid the mass corruption of the Antichrist that is coming. That is the way some people have been interpreting what is about to come. But this is the insight the Lord has given to me. Look at what it says here, that they will force us to the border. They will force us to the corner. They will make us feel like we cannot even talk in public. Because the moment you express your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're seen as the enemy. The moment you say, this is what the word of God says, they immediately start saying to you, you are of the hate, that is hate speech, that is this and that is that. They would not allow for us to have freedom to function within the society. And this will come by the men of the confederacy. Now let me tell you something that we have just read, but we may not have thought about. So we're going to read it again, and I pray that you get it. See what the Word of God says. The Bible says, men who are at peace with you shall deceive you. We have come to a time wherein the nations and the governments who claim to be for our peace are actually the ones deceiving us. The truth is coming from the other side. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Is it clear enough? Maybe not yet. This next statement will make it very clear. Look at what the word of God says. The Bible says, they shall deceive you and prevail against you. Okay? Not very exciting, but it is what it is. Now, those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you and no one is aware of it. Who are the ones who eat your bread? The ones who eat your bread are the ones who will lay a trap for you. Now, I'm going to say that on a very national level. <laughs> the same people that take out of your bread on a regular basis are the ones laying a trap for you. They are not from here. The Bible says that they are the foreigners whose palace is oppressing us. You may have to listen to like four messages back to fully get this gist, Marianne. But for those of you who are here, remember when I was telling you when the word of the Lord came forth that the judgment of the Lord is coming upon the foreign palace and it's going to crumble? These guys are not, they do not see themselves as one of us. That's why the Bible calls them foreigners. Why? Because they believe that their habitation is in the stars. They think of themselves as superhuman beings and the rest of us were just peasants that can be done away with. But still, they take our bread because there is no bread in the stars. 
According to Job, Job says there are men who depart in shafts to places that have been forgotten by the feet that hang to and fro. He says, but as from the earth, from it comes bread. They keep telling you that they want to explore other other corners of the universe. But the reality of it is that there is no life anywhere else. The Bible says from the earth comes bread. They are so high-minded. They think about all of these worlds that they want to create, this utopia that they want to build. Anything that is removed from the earth loses the ability to sustain man. But they keep taking your bread. But what they're doing is they're laying a trap. And guess what the Bible says? The Bible says no one is aware of it, not even your woke neighbors. All those woke evangelists on the internet are not even aware of it. Because what are they being walked to? You see, walkism itself is a carnal tool. Walkism, people say, oh, now we're walk, we're walk, we're walk. The reality of it is that Satan is the champion of walkism. How did he deceive a third of the angels in heaven? Because he was walk. Oh, yeah. He be walk, and the rest of them are like, have you spoken to Lucifer lately? He's got some great ideas. Under God's noses, a third of the angels were deceived. I want you to put it in perspective. God is never in the consensus of opinion and God is never in the majority. You see, the moment you see the majority of people doing something, go in the other direction. Many believers are being strung along to hell today in the name of wokeism. Because all of what they believe, it means what it means to be woke is essentially Satan knowing that at some point people will be tired of the narrative. They're going to be tired of the deception and they're going to find a way on their own. So he already created a woke movement to receive those people as they're coming. They're like, you're tired of the narrative? Come right here. The Lord says no one is aware of it. It gets more interesting by the time you get to verse 9. I'm just going to go over it very quickly. But I want you to study this thing on your own. God is putting on your lap this day the strategy for the wisdom for the times that we're in so that you are not swept away by the wind of deception. Deception is at an all-time high, strong. But you are stronger. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In fact, that would take us a lot of time. Let's just go to Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Let's go to Romans chapter 6 verse 3. I have come to you today in the spirit of prophecy because your hearts need to be equipped against what wind is about to blow. The Bible says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. This is the way out, folks. The way out is to be dead to this world. The way out is what? is to be dead to this world. And I'm gonna tell you some things very quickly why you need to be dead to this world. You see, this world is not what we think it is or what many people have thought that it is. This world, as it is, is being ruled by the arch enemy of humanity. Satan is called the prince of this world. And that includes the religious order, that includes the economic order, that includes healthcare, that includes security. It includes a lot of the things that we have come to depend on for sustenance. So if you are going to continue to strive for sustenance, then you may never be divorced from the system. But if you are ready, to be baptized like Jesus was baptized unto death, then they don't have a hold on you. It is a hard saying, but the one that is worthy of being repeated. I'm going to give you some, some more, again, I'm using the word domestic examples, right? You see, many of us, we grew up surrounded by people 
surrounded by friends. You never like to go eat alone. You never like to go swim alone. You never like to go hiking alone. And you have come to believe that your life depends on your association and fellowship with certain people. The devil knows that. And so the devil will come in and possess the ones that he already knows are lost so that they can be instrumental in getting you lost as well. But the moment you come to recognize that you already have the life of God in you and you do not need the sustenance of the world or the sustenance of the society, then guess what happens? Satan can no longer use those people to draw you out of your peace. So y'all need to be ready to die to certain relationships. Y'all need to be ready to die to certain kinds of pleasures. Some of you need to die to girls' trips. Some of you need to be ready to die to certain family events simply because Satan knows that you draw a lot of life from those. And as long as you're thinking as somebody who wants to live, you will not let go of those wells. And the Lord is saying, I need you to be ready to die and not live. Because the moment you're ready to die and you're living your life dead to sin and alive to Christ, then guess what happens? Every one of those those things will start to fall off. Satan will run out of artillery to use against you because his weapons, are, his, his devices are only effective against people who are already in the line of death. Let me, say the, let me say it this way. If you're not already on the path of death, Satan cannot kill you. How do people get to be on the path of death? By loving their lives. Jesus says, whoever loves his life will lose it. But the one who loves not his life, not even unto death, shall find it in this world and in the one to come. You need to come to a point wherein it doesn't matter whether you have friends or not. It doesn't matter whether you can go out or not. It doesn't matter whether you do something and you get recognized for it or not. You need to recognize that the accolades of men has nothing to do with you because you don't live on those things anymore. You need to recognize that if you put up a post and only two people like it, you are still accepted in the beloved. Don't do things because of what others will bring because all those people who appear to be feeding you are essentially taking your bread and they are not your friends. You see, I don't expect people to like what I post because I don't live on their approval. But they are the ones coming to eat my bread because they see what I post and it's blessing them. But then at the same time, their hearts are so wrong that they cannot say thank you. They want to hurt me instead. But they can't hurt me by withdrawing love and support from me because I don't live on their love and support. In fact, I am not looking to live. I am looking to die like Jesus did. And what does it mean to not look to live and look to die? You see, to look to live is to look to see the continuation of this life as it is. But to die is to say, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I want the new life that is coming. You just read it. There is a new life that is available to you. The Holy Spirit said to me yesterday, I read an article and he said to me, he says, this is what will kill the world. And you know what it is? Many people in the world today are looking forward still to normal to return. Many people are still looking for things to return to normal. People are like, oh, you see this COVID has blown away. Uh, we can travel now. We can do this now. We can do that now. Their expectation is for the life that they know to continue because that is what they have already seen. But the Lord is saying, if you do not develop the divine ability to see what is not yet here, you will not make it. So you need to start to see newness of life. Okay, I'm going to balance it off today with another verse of scripture that looks like the one we just read. Romans chapter 3 verse 6. And once we read that Romans chapter 3 verse 6, I'm going to explain for two, three minutes what I believe the Lord is doing with us. Romans chapter 3 verse 6. Look at what it says. It says, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? It says, no. If, if things continue the way you want, how will God judge the world? What was I saying to you earlier on? Oh yeah, I was saying to us earlier on that if the darkness does not come, what will be the justification for the light that you have? How will God judge the world if 
political organizations and governments are not taken over by Satan and made corrupt so that they promote immorality over morality. Because if everybody's promoting morality that is by the doings of men, then God cannot judge the world. So the reality of it is we need to wake up to a different consciousness. A different kind of thinking. You see, God is speaking to us in a different language, but we need the consciousness of heaven to be able to engage him as he is speaking to us the divine guidelines of how to begin living the new life even before this one ends. Let me say that again very slowly. I'm going to use an example that many of us like and we can relate with. Many of us have always believed that money comes by you going to that job and getting paid. And that is the reason why you don't want to offend that employer. You want to do all of the things that they're saying. They say take the job, you take it, take times two, you take it, takes times four, you take it because you have come to believe that that is how your sustenance comes. Right? That is the way of the world. Where does your sustenance come from? Your sustenance comes from the one who put you here and who is primarily, primarily responsible for you and who has made a commitment to supply all your riches and glory according to Christ Jesus. And so basically, the way things truly work is that everything that you need for your sustenance is already on the inside of you. You just need to engage godly wisdom to bring it out. You don't need a middleman. The middleman is eating your bread while continuing to oppress you. A new world is coming and it will appear as though it hasn't come whereas some people have already started living it. What did the Bible say? The Bible says no one will know it. People will not know but you should know it because you have the mind of Christ. Many of us, God wants to bring us out of the world system of servitude, but we are not seeing the salvation of God. God wants to show you how to draw from heaven directly without this middleman that is a corrupt system. God wants to show you how to make friends without compromise. He wants to show you how to be surrounded by fruitful and faithful people without necessarily doing things that you don't like to do just because if I don't do it then they're not going to invite me the next time. You see what I'm saying? There is a new kind of thinking that God expects and it begins with you not loving your life unto death. Be ready to let go of everything so that you can gain everything. In closing, we're going to break bread with a verse of scripture from Isaiah. I think we're still going to be in Isaiah the rest of this month. Um, Isaiah 21. Let's quickly go to Isaiah chapter 21. And then from there, I'm going to give us some practical tips that we can begin to utilize. Uh, partly because certain questions were asked on the Moses and Rosemary Q&A yesterday that really prompted within me the need to share certain things with us partly as a rebuke and also as an encouragement. So Isaiah chapter 21 verse 7 holds a mystery that we can draw from and begin to exercise. Isaiah, I mean 21 verse 7. It says, And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys and a chariot of camels. And he listened earnestly with great care. Folks, I want us to open our hearts to receive divine wisdom for the times that we're in. I'm going to read this again and then I'm going to see if I can explain very quickly what I believe the Lord is saying to us here. The Bible says, and he saw a chariot. Let's read verse 6 for those people who may not have been following that we are in the time of the watchman, right? We have come to the season of the watchman. This is our time. And one of the things that we saw about the watchman is that the season of the watchman came when the season of the destruction and the judgment of disobedience came as well. So in the midst of all of what's going on, it is also your season. 
So how do you decipher? Verse 6 says, For thus has the Lord said to me, Go set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. Okay? And that's what I've been doing all day. I've been declaring to you what I have seen. And I'm encouraging you to also open your eyes to see what the Lord is showing you, but don't stop there. Look at what verse 7 says again. And he saw a chariot with a pair of horsemen, a chariot of donkeys, and a chariot of camels. And he listened earnestly with great care. Many of us, the moment we see the horsemen, we see the chariot, we conclude that we know exactly what is going on. But the Bible says that even though he knew what he was seeing, he decided to listen earnestly. In 2021, what did the Lord say to me? The Lord said to me, in the darkness, I will guide you not by what you see, but by what you hear. Last week, what did the Lord do again? The Lord brought to our remembrance that we have come to a time wherein we need to be very attentive to what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches because things are not what they seem to be like. I can see the horsemen very clearly from where I'm at. I can see destruction coming very clearly from where I stand. But what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to listen because what I see needs to be supported by what I hear. Otherwise, I will become discouraged by what I see. Even though I see the horsemen, the camels, the donkeys, the chariots, I am listening to see, to hear exactly what my heavenly father is saying. This secret holds, this secret in fact is like a glue that binds you to the heart of God in the times that we're in. So now let me take you to the next couple of weeks and share with you some of the things that the Lord has said to me. In the next couple of weeks, there is going to be war that is declared. And once they are declaring the war and announcing the measures that they are taking to weaken the opposition, certain governments and nations have been identified as the enemy. And they will come out in the news with their usual suspects and some of the new ones that they have been grooming in the back end. I see new voices, new agents of the false prophets coming to the, to the media houses. They're having a change of God. They're removing certain old faces from television and they're bringing some new faces whose tongues have been dipped in deception. And when they come, every word they speak will be to paint a picture to control your notions, to control what we see. But the Bible says, as a watchman, you're supposed to look and then listen. The Lord will begin to reveal to your heart exactly what you must do, where you need to put your feet, what you need to hide, what you need to release, what you need to increase more of, and what you need to decrease more of. You see, God wants to do a work on the earth, but this work is a work for the benefit of the sheep who are loyal to the good shepherd. You see, if your loyalty to the Lord Jesus by being able to pay attention to what he is saying is not firm, you will be carried away by what you see. So like I told you, I'm going to tell you exactly why the Lord brought me here today and what things I am saying, why I am saying them. I say them because the Lord wants to multiply us. The Lord wants to what? He wants to multiply us. He wants to multiply us, those of us that he considered, considers to be his remnants on the earth. We're not as many as we are needed to be and the Lord wants to do a work of multiplication and only the ones who are mature will multiply. And the ones who do not multiply, they will be done away with. Jesus said it this way. He says, every tree that is fruit bearing, any tree that does not bear fruit, my heavenly father will remove. God wants fruit bearing believers so that he can multiply them and the ones who are not fruit bearing will not even be allowed to continue to take space. So how do we ensure maturity? We ensure maturity by sensitivity to the voice of God. Begin to train yourself now or, or allow yourself 
to be trained. God is the one doing the training. He's the one building his church. But make yourself available in the place of meditation, in the place of prayer, and in the place of worship to hear for yourself what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches. Some of you, your children will come back from where they have been based on what you hear from the Holy Spirit. Some of us, the provision that we need to survive this economic chaos is going to come from the nuggets that the Holy Spirit will drop into your heart of what to do with what's already in your hand. And God is saying, no one will know it. What I'm doing is a secret thing. I'm not going to be broadcasting it for everybody, but I am telling you, Open your eyes, but more importantly, listen earnestly to what I am saying because the ones that you have always thought to be on your side who take your bread are against you. So let us break bread today with this Isaiah chapter 21. And as we break bread, I want you to say, Lord, I choose to listen earnestly to what your Holy Spirit is saying. As we break bread today, let us renew the commitment to seek the Lord diligently. Like I said yesterday, someone asked the question that what do I do when I feel like I am trying to get close to God, but I can't even pray? What do I do when I'm going through what people describe as a spiritual drought? Studying the Bible is not fun. Praying is not happening. You want to pray. Every time you even say you want to fast, hunger would not let you rest. By 10 a.m., you're looking for what to eat. And you're like, man, God, what do I do? My heart is longing for you. Someone asked a question yesterday. My answer was very brute. I said, you can't just settle for not having traction. You need to be resolute. You need to be dogged. The Bible says those who seek God diligently are the ones who find him. I cannot seek God like I'm looking for a new house to buy. I cannot see God like I'm looking for sales on that belt that everybody has that I have on God. I need to seek God more than that. I need to seek God more than I seek anything else. And so when I get into the place of prayer and after like five minutes I feel like I'm just biting my own tongue like I'm not making progress, what do I do? I get up and I shake off the beast and I try again because I need access to the throne. We have become so complacent in this generation because we have everything at our fingertips. You want a burger, you can drive through. You want a new glass of whatever, you can go on Amazon, a few clicks, you download it, it's there. They deliver it the next day. In fact, they deliver now, same day. But that is the world system designed to weaken you and make you forget that you are supposed to run after the Lord as the deer runs after water. Deers don't have bottled water. They have to go looking for water. You understand what I mean? At night in the evening when the deers in the neighborhood want to come and drink from our stream and we're still in the back of the house playing or doing whatever, they don't stop. They go around. They go around to the fire station because they need to drink that water because there's no other alternative. If you've ever been to Sugar Hill, you know how dry it can be. Sometimes it doesn't rain for six to eight weeks. And so then they don't have many options. They have to come to that stream because we live in a valley on a hill. It's one of the few places where you always have water. And so what I've noticed is this, they will find a way to get there. They don't like people. They're usually very shy, but they will brave everything to come to that water. That is how we need to see God. We need to see God as though our lives depend on him. We need to learn how to press until we can pray. The fact that it's not happening the first time doesn't mean that you should quit. The fact that I'm trying to forgive people and and be at peace with them and they they resist me the first time, the second time doesn't mean that is my justification for saying, well, they've chosen to be evil people. I'm just going to go mind my business. No, I'm going to keep trying until the Lord says, you've done enough. His word, his word is the threshold. If I haven't received his word, I cannot compliment or commend myself for having tried. Jesus told a parable in Luke 17. He says, who amongst you, who has a servant, will just watch the servant come in after a full day's work and go straight to feed himself? He said, will you not have an expectation for that servant to still be ready to do your bidding 
This was what the Lord Jesus was saying. And why was he saying that? He was saying that because he knew that a time will come wherein people will choose their own standards and commend themselves for having tried when they have no result. And I don't commend myself for having prayed. Like, man, I've been speaking in tongues for two hours. I've done, I've done enough. I'm just going to go watch TV. No, we do that sometimes. I've been guilty of that. But one of the things that I have learned is I should not be the one to tell myself that it's okay because I am not my own boss. Jesus is my Lord. And so I need to keep trying and persevering until I have results. There are people that you have prayed for and nothing's happened and you're done praying for them because you're like, man, at this particular point in time, it's their choice. No, it is their choice to continue in sin, but you need to continue in righteousness and make that your choice. Simply because the times that we're in, we can no longer play with the enemy because the enemy is out to take your bread and take your life. And so laziness becomes the enemy. What do you do? You deal with it. Complacency becomes the enemy. You deal with it. Self-seeking, self-pleasure becomes the enemy. What do you do? You deal with it. Paul says that I have led too many people to the Lord for me now to be a castaway. So what do I do? I put my body under. We need to learn how to do those things simply because this is what it means to take your cues from the Lord and not from any other observation. I may observe that there is doom in the world, but I need to take my cue from the Lord. The Lord would have me say this to you also, that when that day comes, I see the number 13. It says, some people's hearts will skip a beat and they will never regain that beat. Some people will see what's been displayed and what's been put in front of them. And right there, they will lose hope completely and never recover. They will get up and immediately run in the direction that the enemy is pointing. The Lord is saying that for you to not be one of those people, you must have heard me before the day and let the beating of your heart be in tune with mine. I want to encourage you folks, it's great when we experience healing miracles. It is awesome when we see, you know, people overcome financial difficulties. It is awesome when, you know, someone's arm has been, has been hurting them and now they receive healing. All of those things are great. But the times that we're in, we no longer need to, we cannot afford, I mean to say, to live by bread alone. But we need to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you are not hearing God speak to you expressly, that is your primary assignment. Do whatever you need to do to hear God concerning your children, concerning your own behavior, concerning your own assignment, concerning the world. You need to know what God is saying about everything that is being said. Every subject of discussion, whether it is the issue of sexuality, of morality, of justice, everything that is being said in the world today, you need to know what God is saying to you. You cannot rely on sermons that have been preached because some of those sermons were preached intentionally to give you a particular construct that is limiting you need to hear God for yourself because God is building his church and we have come to the precipice of hell you see when you get to hell that's when you need to hear God the most can I say that again you know Jesus says I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it we have come to the precipice we are standing right now in the darkest regions of our existence and you cannot judge by what you see you have to judge by what you hear We're going to break bread if I can get the communion as well. Do I have one? Please, so that I'm not just observing. I want to be a part of it. Thank you, Gavin. God bless you. And as we break bread today, and we affirm, thank you, Isaiah 21 verse 6. I'm just going to say one more thing very quickly. And let me say this. I know that I've been saying it. I've been sounding like a broken record these days when I keep talking about letting people go. But I'm going to say it again today. God wants to speak and he's speaking to you. But as a watchman, you're more effective when you are in your place, which is on a higher pedestal. So if you're still trying to get even with people, you will never be on that higher pedestal. Okay? It's one of the strongholds that the enemy has pitted against the church wherein Ask anybody in the church. There is somebody somewhere that they have issues with. The Bible makes it very clear. Follow peace 
with all men in holiness with that which no man shall see God. Shayla asked me a question yesterday, I mean on, on Tuesday, I think it was around the uh, area of what if the people are not willing to be at peace? Something like that. They're most likely not willing to be at peace. That's why there's no peace right now. You understand what I mean? They, they're just who they are. I, you pray for them, you believe the best of them, you believe that God will touch their hearts, but you do not allow their action or inaction to stop you from loving, from forgiving, from being generous, from being kind, and then going the extra mile of praying for them. Jesus commanded it. He says, pray for your enemies. And someone is like, well, Pastor Moses, I don't have any enemies. I, I cannot get along with anybody. Before you come to that conclusion and pat yourself on the back, ask the Lord. I said, Lord, is there any wicked way in me? Is there anybody that I may be overlooking? Because some of us are so good at burying the things that we're uncomfortable with so much so that we forgot where we buried it. And you're wondering why you can't pray. You're wondering why you're not seeing visions. You're wondering why you're not hearing clearly. If there is no obstruction, you will see and you will hear. The Bible says there are mountains to climb, there are valleys to walk, but before me, there is an open door. If there is no open door, then that means there is an obstruction. Ask the Lord to reveal what that obstruction is. They hurt you, yes. They took advantage of you, yes. But what you stand to lose if you continue to hold on to them is more than all of what they took from you. Weigh it properly. The Bible says an unjust weight is an abomination to God. It is an abomination to have an unjust weight. Oh, that person hurt me deeply, so I'm going to hold off on forgiving them. No, 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 no. What you stand to lose is heavier than what they took. So what do you do? Adjust your scales accordingly so that you can throw your heart where you need to. In submission to God. And lastly, the Lord would have me say this to you. And in fact, if I were you, I'm going to take this and run with it more than anything else that has been said today. And this is the word. The Lord says, open your mouth and speak. Open your mouth and speak. The world is at a point right now where things are happening so quickly in the realm of the spirit and it is a victory that belongs to the people who are professing. The people who are professing are the ones who are possessing. Don't let any thought weigh you down. Speak up. If you find yourself in bed at night, turning and tossing, unable to sleep, speak. Say something. Break that stronghold. Say something. Change that thought pattern. Say something. In fact, it's perhaps the most practical thing that I have said from here today. Because we have come to a time wherein many of us are getting buried in our thoughts. You keep sighing. You keep saying, hmm, oh. But the Lord is saying, don't just say things that express how you feel. Say things that are the mind of God for what you want to see. You understand what I mean? You have to speak. You have to speak. You see, all those things are related. They're pretty much part of the same thing. Lastly, let me remind you. I think I said this on the call to the leaders on Thursday. The Lord told me a couple of weeks ago, might have been about two months now or so, that we are being dismissed from a general camp. How many people remember that? That we're now going into specialized camps wherein God has special equipping for us as individuals, right? And so that specialized camp, this is what it looks like. What I've been explaining to you so far about listening earnestly to what the Holy Spirit has to say However, your lessons, as specialized as they are and as direct as they might be to just you, Alexis, they are not meant for only you. There is always one or two other people that God wants you to communicate with. So this is something that the Lord is doing in, his, in the church, in, in the ecclesia, in the body of Christ at this season. So do not get in the way. The moment the Lord puts someone on your heart to share with what the Lord just told you in your closet, give them a call. If they don't pick up, leave them a message. Say to them boldly that the Lord has given me a word that I believe is for you and I. Call me when you get a moment. The Lord is looking to multiply the mature and the mature are the fruitful. 
This is one of the ways by which you get fruitful. You speak up, you hear what he's saying, and then you pass it on. You don't have to organize a conference or raise a class. There's usually just one more person that needs to hear it. Let us break bread. So back to Isaiah 21, 6. It says that I will listen earnestly. I will listen earnestly. And so I want you to make that confession today as we are partaking of the Lord's body and drinking of his blood, that we will what? That we will listen earnestly. We will pay close attention because we do not want to miss a thing. Father, I thank you because I am not moved by what I see. Isaiah 21, 7, I am not moved by what I see. I am moved by what I hear. And what I hear is the voice of the good shepherd. What I hear is the voice of the good shepherd. So I will listen earnestly and with great care. In the midst of the chaos, the noise of the chariots of war, I will listen and I will hear. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to break bread, but I knew that I was waiting for something. Right from kind of like halfway in between the message, I knew that there was something that I was waiting on, and it's here. The angel of the Lord has just brought to my attention that there are many of us here today who have recently said to the Lord, Lord, if you would just help me take care of this one thing. So if you are in your one thing season, just like I have been, in your one thing season, where are you saying, Lord, this one thing is taking too much of my attention, is taking too much of my focus. This one thing has just become a thorn in my flesh. Lord, this one thing, Lord, help me resolve it. If you are in your one thing season, the moment you're done breaking bread, I want you to run up here quickly. I want to stand in agreement with you as we receive the one thing deliverance. God has brought to us the day, the power to see that one thing neutralized. The power to see that one thing overcome. So let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, teach them how to listen. Teach them how to hear. Teach them how to listen. Teach them how to hear. Anybody else in their one thing season that wants to come out here? And just say, Lord, I am ready to see that thing resolved, done away with, so that I can be pressing on. I can be pressing on and pressing on, pressing on, pressing on, pressing on. You see, many of us, we are ready for an acceleration. Many of us are ready for that promotion. But there is just that one thing that has been nagging. That one thing. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to just stand here. And as I lay my hands on you here in agreement, I'm actually going to be holding your hand in agreement. Once I hold my hand and pray, then you can go back to your seat. And then the rest of us will keep closing the gap so that I can just stand here. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Father, because that one thing is done. Father, thank you. It is done. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, my brother. That one thing is done. That one thing is done. We have come here today to receive the fullness of that breakthrough. By the hand of the angel of the Lord who brings us word today, it will be unto us according to that word. That one thing is done. And now we're empowered and equipped and set free to go do other things. That one thing is done. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thank you because that one thing is done. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is now time to take other grounds, to possess other grounds, to champion other causes because that one thing is done. As I'm praying for everybody, please lean in. It's a collective word. It's a word for every single one of us. That one thing is done. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I thank you for that one thing is done. That which has been getting in the way of everything else that I believe, that I have seen, that I know is mine and righteousness, that one thing is done in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for that one thing is done. 
It's like a yoke that has just been lingering. And that one thing is done. It is broken. Now it is time to go. It is time to grow. It is time to go. Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, because that one thing is done. That one thing that was needed is now taken care of. I am good to walk upon my high places in the mighty name of Jesus. That one thing is, is done. It is my season of great fulfillment. Hey, Sarababababa. I'm going to speak to you specifically. You see, we are not to commend ourselves, but the Lord commends us. Our commendation is a reservation of the master himself. And the Lord revealed to me, as he was speaking over you, that a lot of what you have done, you have done because of the sense of duty. You're a dutiful person. If it needs to be done, you have to do it. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Not because it's what you've enjoyed doing the most. It's not because you find fulfillment in what you've done, but you have found contentment in knowing that you are being dutiful. And now in this season, you will find fulfillment. That which your hand will find to do, you will do it. You will be dutiful, but you would also find fulfillment. You will find joy. You see, you don't even need motivation because that joy is pure inspiration. Getting you fired up, getting you ready to go, getting you to overlook little troubles just because of how joyful you will be in this next, next season, in that which your hand finds to do, in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because that one thing has seemed to be a big thing. Do you know that even in recent times when you think about other people and when you hear their story, it sounds like even they find that one big thing to be very crucial as well? You see, but it doesn't matter how crucial, how important, how difficult, or you don't, none of those matters. One thing that God is saying today is because you need it to keep going and to keep growing, the Lord has given it to you. Your one thing is situated by the hand of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for that one thing that your daughter has identified as she came responding to the call today. She knows that that one thing will go a long way in giving her peace, in helping her to hold on to the peace that you have given. And so it's not like you haven't tasted peace. It's just that it slips faster than, than you can grab it sometimes. It's like, man, I, I, I feel like I'm just about to be at peace. I feel like the Lord has given me peace. But before you know what's going on, it seems to be slipping away. The Lord is allowing for you to come into his rest. This is your season of that one thing that will not elude you any further in Jesus' name. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for that one thing, not just in her life, but in the life of the other. I thank you for that one thing that you have revealed to your daughter concerning her child. That one thing is done for him as her one thing is done also in the mighty name of Jesus. His one thing that the Lord has revealed to you is already done. It's situated. It is situated in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, because anything that has been in the way, all of that crying in the middle of the night and saying, Lord, if this can just be situated, I'm just going to be able to breathe. You have your one thing miracle. You have your one thing done and situated. It is an equipping for you. It is not to bring you to a place of just saying, now I can put my feet up. It is to equip you to be able to run and do what you need to do. The Lord sees your heart. The Lord grants you his favor today and your heart desire in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The one thing, the one person. The one thing, the one person. You are already schooled in the business of cherishing one thing. And so, this is not going to be by your ability, but this is going to be by the mercy of God, but you will have your one thing. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, we give you praise. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for my wife, for this woman, and for the one thing that she has on her heart that she brings upon the altar today. You see, that which you have brought upon the altar is already taken up by God. It is taken up by God, and it is done in Jesus' name. Let us just give God a big shout of praise. Let's praise God. Let's thank him. God is good. Alrighty, and so one more thing that I'm going to encourage every single one of us to do is I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 in your own spare time. Uh, maybe not in your spare time. That's kind of like a very casual thing to say. Make time to go to Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. And I just want you to focus on one thing. So let's read it together. The Bible says, Therefore I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. 
Matthew 13, 13, I meant to say. So I'm glad I already had it open here, otherwise we'd have been reading something else. What does it say? It says, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Okay? So what did we see? We read earlier on that no one knows what's going on. Most people are oblivious to what is really going on. Even though God is making it very clear through all of these parables that you see the earthquakes, the clouds, and all of those things. But God is saying that not only do they not see, they also don't hear either. Neither do they understand. And so I want you to press in with God and say, Father, I thank you because I see, I hear, and I understand. I see, I hear, and I understand. For you to see, you have to look. For you to hear, you have to listen. For you to understand, you have to meditate. So even though you're professing before the Lord, I see, I hear, and, and understand, your part to play is to keep your eyes open, to listen earnestly, and to also meditate diligently. God bless you. It's your time to be elevated in righteousness. Amen. Let's celebrate the Lord again. <clears throat> and thank him for this word that has come forth. And let's prepare our hearts to give. We'll see the offering details there on the screen to our family online. There are several ways to give at Communion House, both Cash App and PayPal, as well as the Zelle contact number you will see there. We will allow for a couple of more seconds and we We'll go ahead and give God praise via offering. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for this evening. As you have reminded us of your word, even in the book of Isaiah chapter 21, verse 5, prepare the table, set a watchman in the tower. Father, we thank you for this community of watchmen. Lord, how you allow us to see, but not just see, you allow us to hear, oh God, and not just hear, but also to understand. We thank you for the spirit of understanding that you have granted to us, especially in this season. Father, we thank you for wisdom. We thank you for being able to know the why, the how, the what, the when, so plainly, O oh God, you deal with us. And we say unto you, we don't take it for granted. Lord, let these offerings unto you in this moment, in this time of meeting, be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. For Lord, you alone are our provider. Lord, you have made it such that the earth produces bread, O oh God. All of these things in the earth, all of its fullness belongs to you, O oh God. And we give you thanks, we give you praise because you have seen fit for us to be ones to partner with you in implementing your kingdom here. Lord, we say that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord one more time. Hallelujah. So much homework we've been given. Um, and so let's make sure this will air tomorrow evening, 6 p.m. Let's make sure to get this digested. There was so much here, and we know it's been deep ministering unto deep, uh, but we want to be able to run with this, okay? And so we need to exercise it, make sure we're playing it throughout the week, even while we're at work. Just let it get in us uh, because so much has been uh, given to us in instruction just over the coming days, okay? So we give God praise for that. Uh, don't forget, we'll be back Tuesday, Family Dinner and Teaching Tuesday. And uh, we're excited to just be in that mode of fellowship. I know uh, we did a great job of taking business cards. We have some more, so if you need some, even if you don't see them there, I can hand some out to you uh, and make sure we just continue to push because we know the ones that the Lord has given us to minister to and those ones we need to be praying for, amen? All righty. Everyone have a blessed night. Oh, baptismals. Tomorrow, 4 p.m.
No, th- oh, shakaka, hallelujah. 3 p.m., okay? Um, if you or someone you know, if you're ready to be baptized, pastor is making himself available for baptism tomorrow, Lake Lanier, Buford, okay? Get with me. We're seeing those details. There's a specific spot in that area uh, where we'll be uh, uh, handling those, okay? So again, if you need the details, come find me and we'll go from there. All righty? Y'all have a blessed night.